it looks like we're about a week away from the next series of rate cuts. The FOMC meets next Wednesday to determine where they're going to set the Fed funds rate. And if we take a look at the Fed Watch tool over at the CME group, about 85% chance that we're going to get a 25 basis point cut. That's at least what the market is currently pricing in. So it does look like those rate cuts are coming. And in this video, what I want to discuss is really that I think the Fed just has it wrong here. I mean, a best case, the Fed just doesn't matter. Worst case, the Fed probably actually has it backwards. And what I want to do is piece through some various elements of this in terms of why we think the Fed just kind of has this whole rate cut idea wrong. And in fact, over the next few videos, since there's so many different angles, facets of this, we're going to discuss this and break this down from a couple of those ways in which you can look at this that just are kind of counter alternative to kind of the mainstream idea here of what rate cuts and what Fed rate policy is actually doing from this kind of applied MMT perspective. So that's what we're going to be diving into in this video. So if you're new here, get subscribed to that notification bell on so you won't miss those follow up updates on this concept. So what, what I want to do is I'm going to walk through really just kind of what the nominal implication is. Like, What is the dollar amount implication of rate cuts when you think about it in terms of what they're supposed to be affecting in the macro economy and why what we'll kind of finish off with is the empirical data just shows a different picture than what is actually expected based on rate cuts historically if we go all the way back, say, 60, 70 years. And what we're going to do, like I said, is we're just going to start with this concept that if we get 100 basis points worth of cuts over a year, what is the dollar amount implication of that relative to the public and private sector? But before we get there, I just actually want to start with this point right here, which is that rates are what we pay ourselves, right? I think there's this idea that we are somehow with rate hikes paying that money out of the system that the cost that those higher rates are causing the, the borrower somehow gets sent out of the system that that's income that's lost and that when you get rate cuts happening that that somehow income that is coming into the system or those cost savings aren't coming from somewhere else but every loan has an issuer and a borrower, right? There's a lender and a borrower, and whatever you do to rates is going to affect both sides of those. In other words, when you bring rates higher, that's going to mean more income for the person willing to lend and higher costs from the person willing to borrow, and vice versa. As interest rates get pushed lower, the income for the lender decreases, but the cost for the borrower also go down as well. So it's really a net wash. And that's why from this kind of MMT perspective, we just say that interest rate policy and the change in rates is not some sort of change in the macro direction, but just a change of the winners and losers within the private sector. So bear that in mind as we go through just the nominal value here that that argument that there's somehow almost this black box that we're paying out into when rate hikes happen or this black box that somehow magically adds returns to the system when rate cuts happen it just doesn't exist there is just the private sector that is lending and that needs to be affected through other causal mechanisms which we'll get to in just a second but let's do this let's start out with just what 100 basis points worth of cuts is going to look like for the two major debt loads that are out there, the public debt, the national debt, and the private debt, and what ends up being saved in this scenario, even though it's probably not correct to even call it saved in any way. What is the, what is the actual nominal effect of this 100 basis points worth of cut? So I'm going to go through the logic and bring you through exactly how we get to this $20 billion per 100 basis point cut at the end of this. And then you'll see why, again, at best, it is just a... It's a wash, right? Very little in terms of kind of causal mechanism here that can actually happen. And again, as we'll see, the empirical data plays this out. So we're going to start with just some, you know, close to correct, but round numbers. 38 trillion for national debt, 41 trillion for the total private debt load that currently exists. So the private debt load is just essentially the loans that have been created on the private side that have funded the private expansion that we've seen, and then the national debt being the additional net financial ad that the federal government is spending into the private sector. Now, rate cuts are not going to affect the entirety of both those debts. It's only going to affect the amount of the debt that either gets created into the future or the current debt that's outstanding that would be repriced. So we'll look at the repriced version of this currently, and that would be about $16 trillion over, we'll call it one year that would be repriced at that 100 basis point worth of cuts. 
And then the private side debt would be at about 18 trillion, again, estimating here. And if you want to mess with these estimates one way or another, go for it. But again, just kind of rough back of the napkin estimate in terms of debt that's outstanding that would have to be repriced. We're going to go with 16 trillion for national debt, 18 trillion for private debt. And even if I'm off on these, it's not going to affect the end game all that much. We then apply the 100 basis points worth of cuts. And so what ends up happening here is, and this is kind of one of the big MMT insights, is you're going to get $160 billion removed from the private sector that wasn't spent because of those lower rates for the 100 basis point cut. And you can say then, again, assuming that there's this magic black box that this savings is going into, even though, it, again, it's just lending from the lender to the borrower within the system. But even if we just give them the benefit of the doubt, the kind of counter argument, the benefit of the doubt, then there's going to be $100 billion saved by the private sector, meaning that there's going to be $20 billion, assuming the savings is savings, savings for the private sector. So you're looking at $20 billion per 100 basis point let's just say we apply that over one year period of time, you're not looking at that much per month in terms of what a basis point cut is going to be doing, especially when you think of the fact that at the current pace, private debt is growing right above 5%. So that would put it at just over $2 trillion in terms of new private debt. The government deficit is likely going to be right around $1.7 trillion. And then you're talking about... 20 billion for the entire year relative to just these massive money printing machines, both the private and the fiscal side of things. 20 billion is just nothing, right? It's not even a, you can't even call it a rounding error uh, when you're dealing with numbers that big relative to 20 billion in terms of what rate cuts would actually do with regards to the main drivers of economic activity, and that is the creation of these flows, both exogenous and endogenous. And to me, then, when I look at this math and I just do this math, the burden of proof is on the person to that is arguing that rate cuts are going to spur on economic activity to show that greater loan creation happens under lower rates. And the problem for that argument is just empirically, that's not what actually ends up happening. What ends up happening or what we've seen empirically going all the way back to 1960 to today is from 1960 to 1981, we saw consistent higher returns, higher year-over-year growth of private debt where we reached twice in the 1970s, or close to 15% growth year over year with regards to private debt relative to, and that was during very high interest rate regimes and growing interest rate regimes to the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, and then you know most importantly and most telling, the post-great financial crisis period where we had ZERP, where consistently we saw smaller and smaller loan growth peaks during that amount of time. And again, if you look at this chart from just the total private debt year over year rate of change, during the ZERP period, we briefly got over 5% change, 5% growth year over year relative to what we saw back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and heck, even the 90s when we had, at the very least, non-ZERP, non-ZERP policy. It is just night and day in terms of what credit growth shows. So to me, the most straightforward explanation of this is something is happening where lower interest rates actually cap credit growth relative to higher interest rates. And I think the easiest explanation is that higher interest rates essentially offer a risk-free hedge to the whole financial sector to leverage up. Right. That is really the easiest way to put it. And like I said, we're going to have more videos that are going to kind of explain that aspect of it in a little bit more detail coming up very soon. So, again, get subscribed. But that is the easiest answer is you're going to see more loan creation when the private sector, the private financial sector, feels more hedged to take that risk, to be more risky, to create more loans than the other way around when there is not that risk-free hedge. When rates are at zero, the risk-free rate is at zero. And so the base layer, the base capital layer for the financial sector is not yielding, is not returning anything. And in a system where effectively there is no insurance, there is no hedge, you're not going to take more risk. You're not encouraged to take more risk when you can't get a hedge, when you can't get insurance. You're actually 
more likely to take less risk. You're likely to move out of risky endeavors because you don't have that insurance. And that's what really goes to kind of the poor, the core post-Keynesian idea here, which is the two predominant factors for the creation of new money endogenously through bank credit, through you know what we all see as economic expansion is the creditworthiness of the borrower. So that's the, the lender making the supply determination of that loan, if you will. And then on the borrowing side, is that actually a profitable endeavor, right? You're only going to make a, you're only going to want to go get a loan to you know create more money and then ultimately spur on economic activity. If you think that endeavor is profitable, so you have two sides to this equation, creditworthiness and profitability. And the point I'm trying to make is if you go to the actual equation and you actually run the math for what a 100 basis point cut is going to look like over time, you don't change that equation at all. What actually is the more important factor is how fast and how high can private debt creation get and what does the public or national debt, what do the deficits look like over that time frame? Those are the two determining factors, and they are orders of magnitude larger than any sort of quote unquote cost savings that's going to happen for the private sector because of lower lower interest rates. And what we end up seeing, again, just empirically, and I get it, you can come up with different explanations than to me what is just the straightforward explanation that there's this effective hedge aspect to it to disregard the empirical observations that we see. But empirically, under higher rate regimes, we consistently see higher growth, higher peak growth, credit creation. And so the, the, the idea then is that as you get higher peak growth, it creates the things that we need, more profitability because more money is being created and better credit worthiness, again, because that money is being created to support those new loans. And that goes away as rate cuts are happening. So this is kind of the trick here then, and as we think this through to the here and now, as we look at where the Fed has been over the past year or so, we peaked at five and a quarter in terms of the Fed funds rate. We continue to fall, and we're about to go below 4% here, so we'll be at 375 the next quarter cut ends up coming in. We are quickly dropping into a region in which that hedge, that risk-free rate that supports higher risk-taking is slowly disappearing. Now, we're not quite there yet. We haven't collapsed, but we're doing it into the natural kind of end of the cycle when the private sector needs that risk-free hedge now more than ever. Also, as I've been talking about on Twitter quite recently, if you don't follow me, link below, follow me on Twitter as well. We've been seeing the fiscal side disappear very, very quickly this year. So you're having a potential now slowdown it will ultimately be a, a, a slower than what would have been credit cycle finishing off and you're having fiscal continue to diminish here. Well, you're getting in a very dicey scenario, especially if that fiscal doesn't pick up anytime soon, especially if the scenario comes out where Trump is able to keep the tariffs. If all that adds up here, we're not too far away from getting into a very uh, a very dangerous and precarious spot because as that fiscal wanes, as the credit cycle begins to top, you're only going to see economic data come in softer than expected, say mid-2026, which will only want to reaffirm and reconfirm kind of the Fed's worries, which will only want them to continue to cut further, which will only push us into a scenario where bank lending looks less and less attractive reversing the cycle that we've seen up to this point where we've seen this great economic growth since uh, since the end of 2022. So keep that in mind with regards to all the narratives that are going to be out there as we get towards next Wednesday with the FOMC meeting that the Fed likely just has it backwards and that the uh, that the risk here is not the Fed cutting or not cutting enough. It's or you know, yeah, bringing rates down not fast enough. It's actually the Fed is bringing rates down. That is the real risk here that we are going to be facing as we head into 2026. So like I said, get subscribed, turn that notification bell on. And if you are an active trader, active investor, and you like this sort of research and analysis, head on over to AppliedMMT.com. Just two days ago, released our most recent market update. A lot of information. We go into the topics we discussed with a little bit more detail, as well as the implication of where fiscal is at today and where the markets are headed at in the near future. So again, active traders, active investors, head on over there if that is something that interests you. Otherwise, good trading, everyone, and keep following those flows.